بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهد الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبد ورسوله praise be to allah we seek his help and his forgiveness we seek refuge from allah with the evil of our own souls and from our bad deeds whomsoever allah guides will never be led astray and whomsoever Allah leaves astray, no one can guide. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, the one having no partner. And I bear witness that Prophet Sallallahu is his slave and his messenger. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in the Quran, "Ya yuhal ladina amanu taqa Allah, haqa taqatih, wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun." O you who believe, fear Allah as you should be feared, and die not except in a state of Islam. Inshallah, my dear brothers and sisters, today we're going to be talking about a topic which we usually forget. Driven by our fast speed lies, we have so many distractions we, that we tend to forget about our ultimate goal. And that is the Day of Judgment. That is something that we keep distracting ourselves from. The shaitan, the society we live in, the people that we live with, our wealth, etc, etc, the list goes on. And what we do is that we tend to neglect the Akhirah. So what I want to specifically talk about today is a component of that, which is the hellfire. Because that is the thing which we really, none of us would want to be in. None of us would want to be. Even our own enemies, we wouldn't wish, uh, wish them upon this. So, just to quote uh, from a, a very good self-help author, he once said, he who has lost the ultimate is a slave to the immediate. So inshallah, using this as a foundation, today's talk is going to be about the hellfire, inshallah. So what I want to do, I want to first describe the physical outlook of Jahannam, right? I want you to just imagine you're in a plain black field and in front of you is hellfire. However, hadith, however many hadiths you can picture in your head, just try and imitate that in your mind. And inshallah, we'll try and build up a picture as we go along. So there was once a hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu and his companions were sitting in a group, right? And suddenly they all heard a sound. And the Sahaba asked, what is this sound? Yes, yeah, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and they, he said, this was a stone that was dropped 70 years ago in the hellfire. And just now, it touched the depth of it. So it gives you an estimation. The human lifetime is approximately 60 to 70 years. And it took that amount of time for a stone to go from the top to the bottom of hellfire. There are four walls surrounding the hellfire, Jahannam, right? And the thickness of each of these, the thickness of each of these is 40 years. Okay? So imagine the dimensions of this place. And it, there's also another hadith which says that Jahannam was heated for 1,000 years. And then it turned red. You know how you have a flame and it has through different colors, right? It turned red. And then it was heated for another 1,000 years. And then it turned white. You know how you have that blacksmith when you eventually keep heating it up, it goes white? And then finally, it was heated to another thousand years where it turned black. And if you can imagine, we can, so this means we can't even recognize what sort of color this is. It will be pitch black, you can't see anything. SubhanAllah, imagine that plain darkness full of punishment, torture, adab. To continue, there was a hadith where Jahannam, as we know, heaven and hellfire, they're real living things. Right? And we have many different ayats and uh, you know, hadith supporting this. And Jahannam complained. Jahannam complained to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that one of my parts is so hot that it is eating the other parts surrounding it. This is Jahannam itself complaining that one of my own components is too hot. Please, please, please cool it down. Right? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed Jahannam to take two breaths. So when, we, when, the, when Jahannam exhales, okay, that's when we have winter. Sorry, that's when we have summer. That's when it gets really hot. And when, we have, uh, when, he, when Jahannam inhales, that's when we have winter. This is one of the theories that one of the ulama have said. Right? Another thing, and you've, you've probably seen this millions and millions of times in the Quran. The fuel of hellfire, the fuel of hellfire will be men and stones. Men and stones. And there are many different descriptions of what these stones are. Some of the scholars have said, based on some hadith and narrations, that these stones are sulfur brimstone. 
When you, if you ever uh, read about volcanoes, on the top there's a specific and distinct smell, an odor. This is sulfur and combination of sulfur dioxide and trioxide. And this thing is so poisonous, so toxic, that if you remain in the presence of this for long enough, more than 30 minutes, you will feel lazy, uh, sorry, um, what's it called, dizzy, you'll feel nauseous, and you'll eventually lead to your death because it's such a high level of intoxication that can kill you in an instant. Right? Another description is that these stones are actually the polytheistic idols. So you know all these statues where people worship, people commit these shirk, these are these statues. Right? Another explanation is that these are actually the hardened hearts of the non-believers. Right? These are the hardened hearts of the non-believers. So it is advised again and again to really soften your hearts. Go through the Quran. Allow yourself to become softer and closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do not let your heart, so your heart become hard. There's another hadith, and this is this is this one that really sh you know shocked me. There's going to be an explosion in Jahannam. So imagine you have all these pockets of different events that are going on hellfire, right? You have snakes, you have scorpions, whatever, all these things. And there's going to be an explosion in this place. And you'll have an eruption going up in the sky. And this will like form a neck. This is going to form a neck. And from this, it's going to evolve two eyes, two ears, and one tongue. So it can hear, see, and speak. Okay? And this specific adab is for three different types of people. The first one, every rebellious and stubborn one. The first one. Second one, anyone who made an associate with Allah. Yani a mushrik. Okay? And the third one, a painter of a picture. Now I'm not going to go into the fiqh of what a picture is, but this is just to give you a surface value of the adab of uh, one of the adabs of the uh, hellfire. And then there are these external attachments to Jahannam. This is not just itself, there are external attachments surrounding Jahannam. I want you to picture this. You're seeing hellfire in front of you, right? With all these things going on. And in the Quran we know that there are 19 angels appointed over Jahannam. 19 angels, okay? Now, what you need to imagine is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken a specific character and put them inside these specific angels. These angels have no such thing as mercy. When we see another human being go into jail or going through some sort of torture, we have a slight trace, even though as much as we hate him or her, right? We have some, you know, trace of sympathy. Astaghfirullah, that was too harsh. That was too, you know, too hard on that person. But these angels are programmed to not even show you an atom's weight of mercy. Not even Adam's weight. As soon as you are you know, prescribed to Jahannam, these guys will take you and just chuck you in the hellfire without any trace. Right? And there's, they're also going to be mentally torturing you. They're going to be making fun of you. Did a messenger not come to you? Did you not read the book of Allah? Did you not follow what the, you know, what the, what the ulama said? All these different types of things. And they're going to be... Sorry. The hellfire will have 70,000 angels pulling it, reining it in, right? 70,000. Imagine the fierceness. This is like a beast. In some of the ayat, you have hellfire breathing, inhaling, right? You know, like an angry beast trying to, waiting to just get to you. You know when you see a dog and you see with all the saliva coming out, you see the fierceness. Imagine this for the hellfire. Something which is the worst form of punishment that we cannot even think about. Right? So there are 70,000 angels and each angel has 70,000 reins. Each angel has 70,000 reins. So imagine this. And then now there's some internal forms of punishment. Right? Internal forms. There's a hadith which says that snakes, right? There's snakes in the hellfire. These are long necked creatures, right? That are f that if you get bitten by them, if you get bitten by them, you will be in pain for 40 years. And these things are as big as camels. Right? These things are as big as camels. 
If you look at snakes today, in, these, in, in this lifetime, you look at snakes, we have snakes that spit poison, we have snakes you know, that wrap, us, wrap uh, themselves around you and you know, they can choke you, and then you also have something like a Komodo dragon, which some of the scholars have said that these snakes are actually like lizard-like snakes, not pure snakes as we know them today. And if you understand how Komodo dragons work, how they kill their prey, subhanAllah, you will really begin to you know, uh, go crazy about what the sort of punishment they'll be in the Jahannam. Komodo dragons are a specific type of creature which are found in the um, eastern, type of, uh, eastern type of countries like Indonesia and Thailand. And the way they work, right? they don't have any poisonous tongue or anything like that or bite. What they do is that they just bite the prey and then leave. So they just bite the prey and they leave. Okay? And what happens is, in their bacteria, in these Komodo dragons, there's a bacteria in their teeth which sort of dissolves the flesh inside you. Then after six days, as it keeps eating you away, they come in a pack and they surround you and they play with their prey. They play with their prey and then they come in and slowly eat you from your stomach inside out. This is in this lifetime. This is in this lifetime. Imagine the form of punishment in Jahannam. Right? Imagine these snakes are going to be monstrous sizes. These snakes are going to be black as hell with red eyes. I don't know what. Can you just imagine the sort of punishment they'll bring you? The khawf that you will have. We get afraid just by a small snake. Imagine the size of a camel. There's also another hadith which says about scorpions, right? And these things will be the size of donkeys. Size of donkeys, right? And they will also, if you get, a, you know, if you get stinged by their tail, you will have 40 years of pain from this same size, from this scorpion. And if you look at scorpions today, right, these things are about, they fit the palm of your hand. They fit the palm of your hand. And some of them, they have a sack which is full of poison. Some of them, just one jab and khalas, you're done. You are done. Imagine the size of a camel. Imagine the ferociousness of a size of a, of, of a, of a, of a donkey, sorry. These are the sort of things we need to instill in our head, right? The fear of Jahannam. Are we really doing anything we can to make sure we stay away from this? Right? And just to conclude with a few final pointers, there's something also called Zakum, which I'm, which I'm sure many of you heard of. And there's, there's, a, there's an ayah in the Quran. For it is a tree that springs out the bottom of Jahannam and its fire shoots out of its fruit stalks like the head of devils. Right? And there's another one in uh, Surah 56, Ayah 51 to 6. Then you will fulfill your insides therewith and drink boiling water on top of it. Indeed, you shall drink like diseased camels raging with thirst. And this zakum, this zakum is, is sort of like a, um, what's it called? it's like a plant, a very thorny plant. And it is one of the most disgusting things you can eat. It is, there's a hadith narrated about it that if you, if the, even just one of these plants, came upon the earth, it will pollute all the waters. It would pollute all the waters. And it's sort of, it's, it's so prickly and thorny that it gets stuck inside the middle of your throat. So when it says, when you drink water, this water is not going to be like normal water you find here. This is going to be boiling water. And it's even described as melted brass, to the likes of melted brass. You see a kettle, you know when it boils, can you drink that steaming water? Of course not. This is worse than that. This is equivalent to a metal being boiled in your throat. So, uh, and I just want to conclude with one, one final point. Do you think, okay, just keep this image of the hellfire in your head. Do you think you are safe from the hellfire? Do you think that you have a clear access to Jannah? There is a hadith, and I've mentioned this again and again, that out of every 1,000 people, only one will go to Jannah. Only one. Let me put that into perspective for you. This university has 33,000 students, right? Take a thousand of that. 33 people. 33 people out of 33,000. How many people are in this room? 100? 150? Put yourself in that perspective and really question yourself where you stand. You have two big enemies, the shaitan and your nafs. Shaitan and your nafs. Understand the importance of these enemies and how they will bring you down in this life and the hereafter. Right? Really question yourself, where do you stand?
Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulullah amin rabbil alameen. Right. After speaking about hellfire, I just wanted to point out one very big misconception that people tend to have these days. When, when you do a sin, the worst form of punishment that you can get is another sin. So it keeps building on and on and on and on. Right? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, never ever ever despair yourself of my mercy. Never ever. And there's a hadith in Tirmidhi. O son of Adam, so long as you call upon me and hope in me, I shall forgive you for what you have done. And I shall not mind. O sons of Adam, were your sins to reach the clouds in the sky, and were you then to ask forgiveness of me, I shall forgive you. O son of Adam, were you come to me with an earth full of sins, and you were then to face me without having associated anything with me, I shall grant you an earth full of uh, pardon. SubhanAllah. An earth full of sins. An earth full of sins. You look at Surah Buruj for instance. The people of the ditch. There was an arrogant king who killed all these people just because they believed in Allah. And even after killing all these people, he gave him the chance to repent. He gave him a chance to repent. Right? In another surah, Surah Zumar, verse 53. Say, O oh my servant, you have trans who have uh, transgressed against themselves by sinning. Do not despair of the mercy of Allah. Indeed, Allah forgives all sins. Indeed, it is He who is the forgiving, the merciful. Indeed, He is. Right? And my point is, you have to understand, if you make a sin, okay, don't think that you have deprived yourself of the mercy of Allah. There are so many examples in the hadith where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted direct access to Jannah just because of one of the things they may have done. You know all the story of the 99 men. This man killed 99 people. He went up to an unlearned person, right? Someone who, was just, who seemed to be like an ustad, okay? But he wasn't a scholar. He went up to him, I killed 99 people and I want to repent. Will Allah forgive me? He said, no, 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 no. Go get lost. He killed him. So he made it 100. Then people told him to go to another person, an alim. He went up to him, I killed 100 people. Ya Sheikh, can, I, can Allah forgive me? And he replied, yes. Go to the masjid in the other city, go there and pray. Just go there and pray. And he went. And then in the middle of the way, he died. In the middle of the way, he died, right? And then the angels came down, and now they were having a, an argument. What is going on? Should he go to hellfire or should he go to Jahannam? Because he did all this, but then he was not trying to go this. So they went to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and said, Ya Allah, we have this you know, problem here. What are we going to do? Is he going to hellfire or is he going to heaven? He said, measure the distance between him and the masjid. If it is less from the distance between him and the previous city, then khalas, forgive him. And then as they were going down, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changed the face of the earth by making this distance shorter, even though it's bigger. He made it shorter. Right? He went, they went down, measured it, and they put it into Jannah. Now, my question is, did he even make a sujood? Did he put his head down on the floor? No. What changed was his heart. What changed was his heart. And this is the most important thing. You make that first step, the intention to repent. That sincerity. That is what makes you go closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jalal al-Din Rumi, a famous poet, very famous poet, Islamic poet. He once said that the commentary of the tongue makes everything clear. But the tongueless commentary of the heart is clear for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Ponder and reflect on this. And my final point, okay, this book, which is the Quran, which is our, you know, our, our pretty much our decree, our creed of law, our creed of life. We need to connect with this. We tend to forget this. Everyone, we all tend to forget this. We are too busy with coursework, too busy with this, too busy with this. So when do we ever put a time in our lives to give this focus? This is our book. This is the thing that will give us access to Jannah. Learn it, read it. Teach it. Go for it. Put it in your heart. Don't just put it at the back of your head. Khalas, I'll learn later. Go for it. 
This is the Quran. This test, this is, this is just going to be one second of your life compared to, you know, the uh, hereafter. Just a few seconds. The Prophet said, put your hand in, in a finger, so you put your finger in an ocean. And you know when you take it back out, whatever water you have left, that's this life compared to the ocean which is the hereafter. So don't take it for granted, oh I'll do this tomorrow, I'll do this tomorrow. No! Do it now! Go read the Quran now, understand it, reflect upon it, get closer to your Lord. And I'm pretty sure you know, there's a very famous Sheikh in UK. He's mashallah, one of the most amazing scholars I've seen. His name is Sheikh Haytham Al-Haddad. Mashallah, he's in the Shira Council, he's in Muslim Matters, he's in all sorts of programs, okay? And he, in one of his videos, he in one of his videos, this guy is 56 years old. He was crying, he was crying because he told everyone that I was so ignorant that I did not learn the Quran when I was young. How many of you here are 60, 50? Very few, very few. You still have the chance. The fact that you have another breath is another, uh, you know, uh, best blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for you to go over his book. Do not waste this opportunity, right? Set targets for yourselves. Say to yourself, in five years time, I will have completed this. I will have completed this. Try and improve your relationship with the Quran. Try and improve your lifestyle with the Quran. Try and become a better Muslim and try and get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes? I just want to make a dua inshallah. May Allah make us all men of understanding, men and women of understanding inshallah. May Allah make us uh, the best of learners of the Quran. May Allah protect us from the shaitan and from our nafs inshallah. May Allah save us from the hellfire. May Allah save us from the hellfire. May Allah save us from the hellfire. Because this is a place where we don't even want our enemies to be in inshallah. Improve our sincerity, prove our character, protect our families. May Allah protect our friends and protect all the Muslims around the world. And inshallah may Allah give all the non-Muslim huda so that inshallah they can least seek protection from Jahan as well. Ameen. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala Ali Muhammadin kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala Ali Ibrahim innaka hamidun majid. Allahumma barak ala Muhammadin wa ala Ali Muhammadin kama barakta ala Ibrahim wa ala Ali Ibrahim innaka hamidun majid. Rabbana atana fi dunya wa asana akhirah wa fil akhirah hasana wa kina azab anna wa aqeem as-salah.